Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to Breakfast Club. I think this is episode 35, maybe. Um, I'm your host, Laurel, and we have a wealth of um, familiar faces with us today, as well as one brand new one. So I'm going to do some quick introductions. We have um, our citizen science co-directors, Dr. Rebecca Johnson and Allison Young, who you've all seen before. Um, we also have our curator of entomology, specifically arachnology, Dr. Lauren Esposito, who you saw just recently. And for the first time ever on Breakfast Club, we have our <laughs> brand new, uh, literally brand new curator of botany, uh, Dr. Sarah Jacobs. Welcome, Sarah. Hello. <laughs> uh, and normally I would subject a new, um, a new uh, visitor, what do we, what, guest? Presenter? Guest. Presenter, yeah. To, uh, <laughs> to like my version of the Spanish Inquisition, which is basically like very light, cheerful questioning. Um, but we're actually getting you back on Thursday to talk mm -hmm. about parasitic plants. So I'm going to save most of it for them. Okay. Um, yeah, and we're all here together today because we are kicking off a, um, a pretty special week of celebrations that started with California Biodiversity Day. And I'm actually going to let uh, Rebecca or Allison, would you kind of tell us what we're doing here today and generally what people can expect format wise? Sure, yeah, I'll introduce um, like kind of the outline of the, the presentation okay. this morning, or our talks this morning. So um, we're here because we're celebrating California Biodiversity Day together with a bunch of state partners and folks all throughout California who are, you know, just celebrating the plants and animals and the amazing diversity of our state. Um, so today we will, Allison will give you a little intro to Biodiversity Day and what it is, how you, and let you know how you can take part, like wherever you are in California. And actually, even if you're not in California, because a lot of it's virtual this year, um, what you can do to learn about California Biodiversity Day. And then Lauren, Sarah, and I will introduce you to three specific challenges um, that will help our science and will be really fun. Um, so that's really what we're going to do today. Um, we're looking forward to sharing our this new idea of setting you guys on challenges and um, also just telling you how you can participate in Biodiversity Day and what we're all celebrating here. Awesome. And I think we wrote this, I think, in the introduction, but you told me, um, I think it was you, that, um, and I didn't actually know this, that California has a higher number of endangered species than any other state in the U.S. Is that right? That is correct. Yeah. Okay. And how we, you, I mean, yeah, it's just an amazingly diverse place. We also right. have, you know, more plants that are found and animals that are found only here and nowhere else, um, which right. kind of contributes to them being endangered, right? Because they're only found here and then if they're threatened by um, development or any other kind of threats, then if they're only found here, it's easy to be endangered. That yeah, makes sense. <laughs> it does. It does. Yeah. And I didn't mean to start with like the, um, the challenging stuff, but I think I was just trying to ask broadly, you know, it's such, California is such an incredible place in terms of the biodiversity. Like, how do you even sum that up for somebody who is, who doesn't live there or doesn't necessarily think about it every day? Just how special yeah. that is. Yeah, I mean, anyone else want to chime in too? With like no, I'm telling you. So just, I, mean, yeah. I think that's exactly why we have this California Biodiversity Day and this celebration over the week is for those of us that think about it all the time because it's part of our jobs. Um, to really um, explain and let other people know who don't think about plants and animals or biodiversity in California very often, or if they do, they don't necessarily think about how unique and special um, it is because it's something they see all the time, right? They're like, oh, this butterfly is awesome, but I didn't know it's only found in my like tiny county, things like that. Yeah. yeah. Did you want to add that one? You know, well, I just wanted to say, like, I think California is super special because it's first, it's like really long which means it like goes through all these latitudes and at like at every latitude there's different stuff basically um and it's also like really tall it has this huge mountain range that creates all these like crazy weather events that like also creates all these unique little spaces all over and because it, it's so long and so tall there's just like all these little tiny pockets all over the state that are like different it's actually its own like floristic province which sarah i don't really know what that means but i know it's like <laughs> something extra special <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of different um, habitats, lots of topographic and environmental heterogeneity, <laughs> which is just a really fancy way to say exactly what um, Lauren was just talking about. Like so many different niches that can be filled by lots of different types of species. Okay, yeah. excellent. 
Yeah. yeah, and we don't want to forget. We don't want to forget that it also has like a huge coastline, right? Yeah, right. So for Alice and I, like you can learn more <laughs> about the coast on Thursday night. We'll be talking about it during night school, but we also have this huge coast that's like maybe like 1,100 miles. I read different numbers all the time, but a lot yeah. of miles. Yeah. <laughs> and Rebecca, you'll talk about that a bit with your project, right? When you tiny little bit, one. tiny little bit. Okay, tiny. great. Um, well, perfect. Okay, so viewers, uh, you are as always welcome to ask questions throughout. Um, just leave them in the comments um, and if you're watching on Facebook or in the chat box on YouTube, and we'll bring everybody back at the end to ask those. Um, and with that, I'm going to kind of, I think, so Allison, you're going to you're going to get us into it, right? Okay, so yeah. I'll I'll let everyone else wave goodbye for the moment and bring them on a bit later. Give Allison her slides. Bye, Sarah. Bye, Lauren. And let's see, and you want uh, these slides? Wait, <laughs> these slides, these ones? Those slides, yeah. Perfect. Okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna leave you to it. Let me know when you want me back. Sure, no problem, thanks Laurel. Yeah, so I'm just gonna give you kind of a quick overview of like what is Biodiversity Day? There's a good chance that even if you live in California, maybe you haven't heard of Biodiversity Day because it's relatively new. So I'll give you an introduction to that and then a little bit about um, for these challenges that uh, we have for you guys during this week, just how do you participate? Like what's what's the platform that we use um, for you to, to make and share your observations of what you can find? Um, so like basically we were just talking about our state is incredibly biodiverse um, due to all those habitats, um, and, you know, in that range of, of from, from the Sierras all the way down to the ocean and from Oregon down to Mexico, um, that we have a huge amount of habitats and biodiversity um, in our state. Um, and like we were also just talking about, we have species, uh, you know, a huge number of species that are found only here um, and nowhere else. Um, in the world at all. Um, and so that contributes to our biodiversity, but like Rebecca was saying, when, the, when you're only found in one particular place, that also um, potentially makes you a little more threatened to uh, um, endangerment, basically, um, when you're only found in a small area. Um, and also, uh, we are what we call a biodiversity hotspot. Um, and so most of California is a biodiversity hotspot. Actually, that floristic province that we were just talking about is the biodiversity hotspot. Um, and what that recognizes is the fact that we have an amazing amount of species in our state and an incredible biodiversity, but that biodiversity is under threat um, due to things like climate change and habitat loss, um, invasive species, competition with invasive species, things like that as well. Um, and so while we have an amazing array of species in our state, we also have to worry about the fact that they are under threat. Uh, and so California Biodiversity Day, um, was signed into existence um, by Governor Jerry Brown back in 2018. And it really is recognizing those two things, that we have incredible biodiversity, but it's also under threat. And so that we as um, Californians and residents of this state or visitors to this state, um, that we have, uh, we have to both understand our biodiversity and celebrate it, um, but also we need to work to help protect it um, into the future. Um, and so one important part of this proclamation is that from this day forward, September 7th shall be observed as California Biodiversity Day each year. Um, so there was this kind of official executive order that um, put California Biodiversity Day into existence. Um, it also came with a declaration for our future. So how do we go about um, both celebrating and understanding our biodiversity, but also protecting it into the future? And um, one of the really important parts and why we celebrate California Bi Biodiversity Day are these pathways to success. Um, and so there's all these events that happen during California Biodiversity Day. Last year was the first year because it was signed in order in 2018. Last year in 2019 was the first time we really had a chance to celebrate it. Um, and this year it's grown substantially. It's much bigger than it was last year. Um, but all the cool events that are happening, which I'll explain a little bit more how you find out about those events um, in just a little bit, all those events have to do with these pathways to success. They're there to help people understand more about our biodiversity, um, to help us protect our biodiversity, to help recover our biodiversity, um, like restoration um, work. And then also to engage and empower all Californians um, and visitors to our state as well. You don't actually have to live here um, to be part of this as well, but basically to give all of us like the agency to feel like we can go out and we can make a difference and we can help um, the scientists and the managers and our state agencies better understand our biodiversity while we're also better understanding our biodiversity as well. 
Um, and so while September 7th is official California Biodiversity Day, um, this year we're actually celebrating California Biodiversity Week, which is actually slightly longer than a week. Um, so it started on Saturday um, and goes through this coming Sunday. Um, and the main reason behind that is that um, I'm sure you probably noticed September 7th was yesterday and it was a holiday. <clears throat> and so it's hard to hold a bunch of events on a holiday because um, I'm sure a lot of us were either um, out enjoying our, our extra free day, our extra day of the weekend, or we were hanging out inside because it was really hot all over all of California yesterday as well. Um, and so by having it be a week, we have lots of opportunities um, for people to host events and to host webinars and um, things like that to um, help do those things, help celebrate, help understand, help protect um, and engage people in California Biodiversity Day. Um, and so there is one website, um, the CDFW website um, has a huge list of all the events that are happening for California Biodiversity Day, starting with multi-day events, so things that you can take do any time during the week, um, and events that are happening on particular days as well. Um, and so we have the link down there in the bottom. Um, if I definitely recommend going and checking that out and seeing if there's an event that you might want to attend or might actually want to go to. Um, here's an example for the events going on today. Uh, we'll say that a lot of the weekday events are virtual, things like webinars um, or virtual tours of places and things like that. Um, but there are some in-person events happening over the weekend, um, like kind of dispersed bio blitzes where you might get together in the beginning, kind of socially distant in the beginning and then go off and um, record biodiversity kind of on your own, but also still as part of a group of people that are doing it all at the same time. And so I definitely recommend checking out this website um, to see if there's an event happening near you that you might want to participate in either virtually or in person. Um, one thing that you can do, though, even if you're not, um, even if there aren't any events happening near you or you're not able to make any of the events, um, is that anywhere in California, we have this project up on iNaturalist, which is a platform I'm going to talk about in just a second, um, where no matter where you are in California, we're asking you to take photos of the species around you. Um, really simple. You just have to get outside, even into your own backyard if you want to, um, or take a walk around your neighborhood and help us document the biodiversity of our state, no matter where you are in it. Um, and so this is a project that is statewide. You can see the requirements that you just have to be in California and you have to make an observation anytime between September 5th and September 13th. Um, and in this project, there's already observations in there because people are already out making observations over the, the Labor Day weekend, um, but there's plenty of a chance to go out and do that. So I want to explain quickly, how do you go out and do, how do you participate in this project? Um, how do you go out and you make these observations? Um, and I will say, I'm going to give a quick overview to iNaturalist, which is the platform that we're using for people to make and share those observations. But while I'm giving kind of a quick overview, there are um, three more in-depth iNaturalist trainings happening as part of California Biodiversity Day. Um, there's one this evening um, at the Laguna de Santa Rosa Foundation, a virtual one hosted by them. Um, there's one tomorrow hosted by uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And there's one on Saturday hosted by uh, San Mateo County Parks. And all of these are virtual. Some of them you just have to sign up for ahead of time. Um, and so if what you hear today intrigues you, but you need to have a little bit more information about how to actually use the platform, I recommend going to one of these trainings that are happening because um, there's lots of chances to learn more about iNaturalist. Um, so the iNaturalist platform, what it is, basically, it's both a free app and a website. Um, and it's designed for people to take photos of the nature that they see around them and then get help with identifications and then contribute to a database of where species are anywhere in the world. Um, and so the way it works, basically, um, is that it, I'm showing mainly the app. You can take observations using a camera as well and upload them to the website. But if you're using the app, all you have to do is take a clear photo of something that you find. You don't even have to know what it is because um, iNaturalist has artificial intelligence or computer vision, um, depending on what you want to call it, that will give you a suggestion for what the, uh, the ID of that thing that you just took a photo might be. Um, you can pick from the list of, of the suggestions that iNaturalist gives you, or if you know what it is, you can go ahead and type it in yourself. Um, or if you disagree with those suggestions, you can type it in yourself. And then you hit share, and that uploads it to the iNaturalist database. And I'm going to show you really quickly a little video um, on how this works. So I'm going to click this. All right, so I'm going to open my iNaturalist app and go to observe, kind of zoom into the snail in Allison's hand, take a nice centered photo. 
and then say next. And if I know what it is, I might know what this is, but I'm going to see if I knew what it is, I can just press what did you see and start typing in what it is. But as you can see here, the, I, the AI, the artificial intelligence in iNaturalist is already making suggestions. And it's suggesting that it's in the genus Oxychilis. And if you look down here for the top 10 suggestions, the top one is this um, Oxychilis, this glass snail. And we are pretty sure that's what that is. So we're gonna choose this one. And then you can see now the observation I made is tagged with a name of what species it is, the date and time and where we are. And we're gonna say share and share that observation on iNaturalist. And you can see here, it automatically starts uploading where it says syncing. So it's uploading that observation and sharing it with the community. Awesome. So that's just a quick overview on what it actually looks like to make an observation in the app. It's pretty simple, but you can see that basically what it does is it takes what would normally just be a photograph and turns it into data by also adding where you are and the date and the time that you saw that thing. And also by putting an ID on it, we can take a photograph and actually turn it into a data point. Once you upload it to iNaturalist, um, the iNaturalist community, which has over a million people in it, anyone who makes observations can also help with identifications. And so once it gets uploaded to iNaturalist with the initial ID that you put in there, the community can then see your observation and they can confirm that yes, it's the right ID or they can correct misidentifications, which is totally fine. Don't worry about getting things wrong. Um, or they can help if you left it maybe at a genus level or if you decide this is a plant, the community can come in and actually help you get it down to species. Um, and that's the goal is to have an observation um, that has a photograph. So it has evidence of that organism that has a location, it has a date, and then that the community agrees what species it is. And so you can see this is that same um, screenshot of what I was showing you before, that seaside daisy. This is what it looks like on iNaturalist itself. And you can see that um, that initial ID of a seaside daisy, the community has come in and agreed that yes, that's what it is. Um, and so now this is an official data point that a seaside daisy occurred at that spot on that date. Um, and that's really important because it helps us understand where species are occurring around the whole world. And especially when we use that information with where they've occurred in the past, um, it can actually help answer some really big questions. And so that's one of the main uses of your observations, whether they're super common things or super rare things, that the database, the iNaturalist database, is open for anyone who wants to answer those big questions about where species are occurring in the world and maybe how their ranges are changing due to things like climate change or habitat loss or things like that, the same things that we're worried about as sp for species here in California. People have questions about those about species around the whole world. Um, and so when you make an observation, you never know when it might get kind of pulled into this um, pulled into a data set that a scientist is using to answer these big questions about where species are occurring now and maybe where they used to occur um, in the past. And so you can see from this map right here, there's almost 50 million observations around the world on iNaturalist uh, made by 1.2 million people, which is pretty incredible. So contributing to that database just helps um, scientists and other people who have questions about where species occur help answer kind of those bigger questions. So that's one really good reason to upload your observations uh, to iNaturalist. Um, another important use of the observations that you make is that you can also look on iNaturalist. You don't have to look just at the whole world. You can look at really specific places. And so you can imagine that um, people who manage places, like people who, like our state agencies who are in charge of the biodiversity of the state or people who run state parks and things like that, um, they are really interested in understanding what species they have in the places that they take care of so that they can make better decisions about how to manage for those species. Um, so here's Mount Diablo State Park over in the East Bay. Um, if you're here in the Bay Area, it's one of our iconic state parks here in the Bay Area. Um, you can see this is what it looks like. Here's the boundary on iNaturalist, but then here's what it looks like with all the observations that have been made um, in Mount Diablo State Park. So you can imagine that, you know, if you have to manage for the plants of, of of Mount Diablo that you would want to understand, you would want to look at this data set and see where people are making observations, where they're finding particular plants, and also like the plants and the other species that they're finding in general. Um, and so we can see here that there's over 33,000 observations made in Mount Diablo State Park of over 2,000 species, which is pretty incredible for a state park. Um, and so uh, this is another way that your data can be super important is that people who manage in particular places, um, people who are in charge of you know making decisions about 
management or policy, um, they can use this information to help inform those decisions. Um, and that's one of the main reasons that we want people to go out and make and share their observations in California is that's going to help our state agencies make better decisions about the, the biodiversity of our state. Um, and so that's a really um, important use of iNaturalist data as well. Um, and then finally, I just want to point out that there's also this cool thing that when you have 1.2 million people around the world going out and making and sharing their observations, that you're bound to find things that you were not expecting. And that's kind of the fun, the fun side of iNaturalist is that you can um, make unexpected discoveries. Um, this is a fish that washed up down in Santa Barbara um, last year, February of 2019. Um, and if you're familiar with California coastal fishes, um, when the fish like this washes up, most of us assume that this is a, a mola mola or a common sunfish. Um, they're pretty common off of our coast. They do end up washing up every once in a while. This seems a, to be a particularly big one. Um, but you can see when this person first took these photographs and uploaded it, their very first ID that they left was that this was a common mola, mola mola. That was the first ID that they uploaded. You can see that's crossed out right now though because they sent, they've since, upload, since updated their ID. Um, but this is an example of how when the community can see your observations, they can actually help correct misidentifications. And so you can see a couple of people came in and agreed it was a mola mola and then someone was like, oh, actually, I'm not sure. It's a mola, but maybe it's not a mola mola. And then this really big conversation happened with all these people on iNaturalist talking about what they are seeing, looking at more photos, um, kind of talking about what the potential options are. Um, and eventually you have this cool moment, this holy mola moment right here, <laughs> where they realize it's this, it's not a common sunfish, it's this hoodwinker mola, this mola tecta. Um, and the reason they were so excited about someone making an observation of a mola tecta on Santa Barbara is that um, in the past, these are, um, uh, it's like uh, museum specimen records. In the past, the only place people found them was down in the Southern Hemisphere, that this observation up here, this is the iNaturalist observation right there. Um, this was the first time uh, that it had been recorded in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, which is pretty amazing. Um, and so that's kind of one of the cool unexpected finds. And you have lots of people out there making observations that you're bound to find something that you weren't expecting. Um, and so that's another really good reason to make and share your observations that you might think it's something really common, but it could be something um, not so common. Um, and kind of a better example of that is this photograph right here, which, um, you know, to be said, is not an amazing photograph, but it's still a photograph where you can see that little pill bug right there. Um, and this is taken by um, our friend and colleague, Jennifer Reisinga. She was at a BioBlitz um, in San Mateo County, um, where lots of people were coming together back when we could actually get all together um, and hold big events. But people came together at this one park in San Mateo County with the, with the goal of spending three hours to document as many species as they could find in this one park. And so she looked under a log and she saw, you know, all these little pill bugs running around or wood lice running around um, and she took some photos and she saw this one that was a little paler so she took a photo of that one too um, but when she uploaded it she just assumed it was kind of one of our common pill bugs um, and that was her initial ID that um, came up but it turned out that this was a species that was actually described from the Bay Area in the 30s and hadn't been seen since then basically um, no one had seen it for over 70 years um, even though people had gone out looking for it um, and she just happened to look under this log and took the right picture um, and it turned out to be this species um, that is now redocumented back in the Bay Area. So it's another kind of example of a cool, unexpected find that can that um, happens when you have lots of people just making observations and looking for things. Um, and the cool thing about this one is that because we know exactly where she was, because we have that pin drop and she could describe what trail she was on, we were actually able to go um, and collect some of these. And now we actually have them in the collections at the California Academy of Sciences. Um, so they're there for people to, to study in the future as well. So another example about how something that might seem really common actually turned out to be something really interesting, um, which is why you should always feel free to share your observations, both of common things and really rare things. It doesn't just have to be the rare, exciting things. You never know when it could be something um, really interesting. Um, I want to just end with some tips for using iNaturalist. Um, out there that there's some good things to know about it. One is that if you're um, making and sharing observations around your house, there's a couple things you might want to know. Um, the On the left here is the Android app and on the right is the um, iPhone app. Both of them have um, these same two settings, although they're phrased a little differently in there, um, about location visibility and things that are captive or cultivated. Um, so if you're taking a photo of something that you know for sure, like you planted it, um, it's just really important that you click that, yes, this is a captive or cultivated organism. Um, if you take a picture of your cat, that should be a captive or cultivated organism. Um, things that basically are where they are because humans are taking care of them, um, those should be 
uh, marked as captive and cultivated. And that's just helping um, make sure that we're not putting observations um, out there as wild observations um, that they're occurring there naturally when instead we actually planted them there. So that's just a really important thing to do to be a good data steward, a good um, iNaturalist user. And also for the location visibility, if you're worried about making a whole bunch of observations in your backyard and people are gonna be able to see those pins where you made those observations, um, when you click that location visibility, um, uh, area there, you get your options for keeping your location open, which is the default, um, making it obscure to making it private. And we recommend that if you don't want to have a whole bunch of pins around your house, just obscure those observations. They end up being obscured in about a 22 kilometer box. And so it's a pretty big obscuration. You'll be able to see where you saw it, but anyone else who looked at your observations will see it just kind of somewhere in this box. Um, and so that's a good tip to know um, if you're worried about having lots of observations in your backyard, but definitely go and make observations in your backyard. I'm sure you can find some cool stuff. Um, other tips for using iNaturalist is that we really recommend trying to take photos that are um, in focus. Um, and so when you make an observation in the app, um, you have a chance. It's kind of hard to see down there, but you always have a chance to retake that photograph. You don't just have to accept any photograph you take. Um, and so in this one, you can see I was taking a photo of this poppy. The leaves down at the base got were in focus, but I really wanted to have that flower in focus instead. So I just hit retry and was able to take another another photograph where the flower itself is in focus. And so we definitely recommend um, working on making sure that your photos are in focus before you upload them, because that's going to help people be able to um, confirm your IDs. Also, you always have the option of adding more than one photo. Um, so here's that same observation, that first photo that's up in the up in the top box up here. This one up here is that photo I just took. Um, if I wanted to add another one, I could just click this little um, plus button next to there. Um, and it gives me the option, there it is, it's circled. It gives me the option of taking another photograph or choosing an image I already have in my gallery. You can also um, you know, make recordings of sounds and things like that, which is kind of cool too. Um, but in this case, I just want to take another photograph. Um, so maybe I want to uh, not only have a photo of that flower, but I want to have a photo of, of the leaves and the little seed pod um, that um, are developing from this plant, because I think that's going to help people um, figure out what species this is. So I can take another photo and add it to my observation. And so now you can see this observation has two photos in it. And then I can share it if I want to. So definitely feel free to take more than one photograph um, when you're making an observation, because that can help people ID what it is that you saw. Um, another thing is um, it's always good to take a photo maybe of the whole plant and then a close up of um, important parts of the plant like the flower. Um, same thing with trees. It's great to get the whole tree, but for someone to make an ID, it's also good to then get in close and maybe take a photo of the leaves or if it has flowers or fruits or of the bark. Um, so definitely feel free to take more than one photograph to kind of get the whole scene and then focus in on the important parts. And also don't be don't be worried about getting your fingers in there also. Um, having your fingers in a photograph, one can help you focus because sometimes your phone has a hard time, it always wants to focus on the background. So by putting your hand in there, you can help focus on what it is that you want, to, want it to focus on. That's totally fine. And also sometimes having your fingers in there helps gives you a, give you a sense of scale. Um, so you can see those little flowers that I saw in some serpentine soil um, in, uh, up in uh, Napa County um, are really, really tiny. And so by having my finger in there, people can get a better sense of actually how tiny those flowers are, which can help again with identifications. So we hope that you have a chance to go and make and share your observations. Like I said, anywhere in California, um, anything that you took photos of starting this last uh, Saturday on the 5th, all the way through the 13th. Um, if you go ahead and you make and share those observations and upload them to iNaturalist, they'll automatically become part of that big California biodiversity project. And we're excited to see what you guys can find. Um, but coming up next, we have um, Lauren and Sarah and Rebecca to talk about a specific set of three challenges, our Spiny Things project, where um, they also, they each are interested in particular groups of organisms or one organism in particular, and they would love you love for you to go and look for these organisms and help share them um, during this week as well to help them with their science and to, just to get a better understanding of where these species occur um, in California. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Lauren Esposito, our curator of entomology, to talk about some scorpions. Hey, Lauren, just jumping in to say that we you're actually muted at the moment. Gotcha, gotcha. Is that better? It's perfect. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I was just talking, telling Allison, thank you. Uh, I always really appreciate those iNaturalist tips because I'm like pretty terrible at iNat for some reason. I just like can't, 
I, my pictures are always awful. I don't know why you'd think I'd be better at taking pictures of things, but I think like the, my problem is, is that usually when I'm using iNAT, it's to try to understand um, things that, that I don't know. Like I wanna help identifying things and it's such an awesome resource for that. Um, and in, I also use iNAT as a tool for sort of like a preliminary investigation in planning my expedition. So like my first thing when I'm planning a new expedition is I go on iNAT and I look up all the scorpion observations from the area that I'm going to, because I wanna get a sense of what people have been photographing, like what species are out there, what things are people seeing commonly? Is there anything that's potentially new that should really be on my radar um, so that I can make sure to keep an eye out for it? There's, there's been many occasions in which people have documented species of arthropods like insects and arachnids on iNaturalist and they've turned out to be completely new species to science, things that scientists have never seen before. Um, and that's always super exciting and like a, an awesome way to get to know the, like virtually the species inhabiting a place before you ever actually visit. Um, so that's one of the main ways that I use iNat. But for our spiny things challenge, uh, I'm really excited to talk to you about the spiny, the first spiny aspect of our of our trio of spiny things, um, which is scorpions in the state of California. Uh, this picture just has a uh, this uh, slide just has a few pictures of a few of the species, um, and these pictures were all taken by an amazing high school student named Prakri Jain, and uh, he is like really turned out to be an awesome scorpion photographer, much better than I am at taking pictures of, of scorpions. Um, and these are a few of, of the awesome library of photos that he's been slowly accumulating of all of the species of scorpion in California. Um, so one of the things that, that Prakri does and, and that I do as well is go on INAT, check out where people have been seeing scorpions in the state of California. If we actually look, we can look at a map of all the observations right now in the state of California of scorpions. Uh, and it looks like this. Uh, and it's, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty good. Like most of the, most of the, the state is covered. But what I want to share with you is a little like nugget of information, which is that there are scorpions everywhere in California. Um, I think that there's very few places where scorpions truly don't exist at all. Um, like if you went to downtown LA, the chances that you find a scorpion are probably pretty slim. Um, but for the rest of the state, you can be pretty assured that there are scorpions there, at least in like the little tiny pockets of natural ecosystem that are around. Um, and so when I look at this map, I see a whole lot of red cells filled in, which means an observation has been made of scorpions. But there's so much that's like green or white that's remaining to be covered. Um, and in this state, we have one of the most biodiversity rich communities of scorpions anywhere in the world. And in fact, there's 63 species of scorpions that are known to science in the state of California. And I know for a fact that there's at least a few more that have yet to be formally documented by scientists. And, and some of those were like the first hints of them were because of observations on iNaturalist. So this challenge, the scorpion part of the spiny things challenge is to go out and look for scorpions. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how to do that and help us fill out this picture of what lives in California, what it's doing, where it lives, what species are here, what their range is, because we just don't know that kind of information for scorpions and I'm dying to, to fill in all these gaps in our knowledge. Um, okay, so how to find scorpions. Well, the easiest way to find scorpions is using a black light or an ultraviolet light. You can buy them these little tiny flashlights. They're like lightweight, they take double A's. You can find them at like a hardware store uh, or on Amazon, they're like six bucks. Uh, they have this purple light that comes out of them. Um, and if you walk around at night, all scorpions fluoresce under ultraviolet light. This is a picture right here of a scorpion fluorescing under ultraviolet light which means that they glow this bright green color that really pops out against their environment, especially at night when it's dark. Um, and you can spot them from like 10 feet away. It's awesome. It's like the best party trick ever. But also if you use this party trick, it will help you to find scorpions and help us figure out what scorpions live in this state. Um, it's sometimes like mind boggling to me that we still don't know everything that lives in the state of California. Like there's so many people that live here where there's people out hiking all the time. There's people, there's scorpions that live in the middle of cities and we still don't know everything about everything that there is to know about what scorpions live here and where they live. Um, so the the one tip, so I asked uh, Prakri 
the guy who took all those photos, um, what what tips he has for finding scorpions because he's really like an I an I not um, uh, expert. I guess I would say, like he's so good at, at going out all over and finding scorpions. And so I asked him what his tips are. Uh, and his tips, which I think are pretty much the same as my tips, um, are that you should go out on, on nights where the moon is, is where, there's, where it's moonless, ideally. Um, but where I would say like at least it's halfway full or less um, because the darker it is, the more scorpions are out. Scorpions' um, behavior is coordinated with the lunar cycle. So when there's no moon, there's more scorpions out because their predators can't see them. And when it's a full moon, there's less scorpions out. The other great thing about no moon is that it makes the UV light, which is kind of a dim light, much brighter. And so it's a lot easier to spot them with the UV light. The good news for us with this week, this California Biodiversity Week, is as we roll into the weekend, so today is the this picture over here on the left of the moon. Oh, this thing just popped up, but you'll see it when it goes away. Um, it's about half, a little more than half full at the moment. Um, but but by when by Thursday it's going to be less than half full, and by the weekend we're going to be like rolling into the last quarter of the moon, which means tons of scorpions, tons of action. You'll have lots of chances to go out and spot scorpions. Um, so go find your UV light. You got a few days. Uh, in advance of the weekend, and then take a little night walk. Uh, you can find them just after dusk. So as soon as the sun goes all the way down, they start to come out, become active, hunting, looking for mates. It's a really good time of the year for spotting scorpions. Okay, so during the day, you can also find scorpions. It's just a little bit more challenging and the UV light doesn't work. Um, but here's a picture of, of Prakrit uh, and another uh, high school student uh, named um, Harper. And the two of them are out looking for scorpions in the state of California. Uh, the places you should look are under anything, under rocks, under logs, under boards, under a sewer grate, under anything you can think of that stays dark and cool throughout the day. That's where scorpions hide. That's where they take a nap. Um, and then in the night, they'll start to come out from those hiding spots. Oftentimes what I look for when I flip things over is I just look for movement. So I like lift over a rock and I just sit there for like, 20 seconds and wait for something to move. And that's usually the best way because scorpions blend in really, really, really well to their environment. So it's super hard to spot them um, unless they start to move around a little bit. But if you just give them a second, they'll start to move. They, they realize that they're in the light, they panic and freeze. Um, and then if you stay really still, they'll start walking around uh, and you'll be able to spot them. The other thing is if you pick something up, make sure you put it back because there's all sorts of things that live in these little micro habitats under rocks and logs and whatever. Um, and so you wanna make sure that you replace that and make that habitat back uh, to its own self so that everything doesn't have to relocate. Um, you can also find scorpions everywhere. So if you're in the desert, great. Uh, if you're not in the desert in the state of California, equally great because there are literally scorpions in the mountains, um, in the in the grasslands, in the savanna. Sorry, not savanna, but you get my point. All these ecosystems that we have in California, um, even right along the coast, not not on the not on the the beach itself, but on the sand dunes up above the beach, you can find scorpions. They're really just everywhere. Um, the good news for everyone that might be a little bit scared of scorpions, or now that I've told you that there's literally scorpions everywhere, uh, you are feeling pretty trepidatious about going out into nature. The good news is scorpions in the state of California are not dangerous to humans. Um, they can sting you. They all have stingers, which is why they're part of our spiny things challenge. Um, but their stinger, their venom is not dangerous to humans. So um, worst case scenario, it feels like a bee sting. Best case scenario, it feels like your finger got pricked by a thumbtack. Uh, no big deal at all. And both you and the scorpion will continue on with your day uh, without fear. Well, the scorpion will probably be traumatized, but you won't be scared of them anymore. Okay, so next up is how to photograph scorpions. Just a few tips from Prakrit and Harper. Uh, here they are taking some photographs of some scorpions in a white box. Uh, great thing is a nice white background. Really, really good thing with the UV light is to find scorpions, but if you photograph scorpions with the UV light, it's really, really hard for us to identify them from photos. So if you are out and about at night, make sure also just for safety that you bring a regular flashlight, um, bring that along with you. And when you photograph them, turn the regular flashlight on and the UV flashlight off for the picture. Um, if you put them on a white background, if you're in a place where it's okay to, to handle them, so you're not in a, a state park or national park, um, and it, you're permitted to handle them, particularly if you're on private property, you can pick them up safely with a work glove um, or with a pair of forceps, long tweezers. Um, 
And if you put them in some kind of box or some kind of tray that has a white background, that makes uh, the image really stand out and a lot easier for us to identify because we can see all the nice tiny little hairs and stuff that we use for identifying species. Um, you should make sure that you release them exactly where you found them. Scorpions construct burrows and it's really important that they get back to those burrows uh, when they're released. And also make sure that you try to get a full body image. So if you just take a picture of the head or just the tail or just the leg, um, we're not gonna be able to identify it. We need all the parts in order to identify these scorpions. Um, other safety things when you're out at night in particular is make sure that you bring a friend. Uh, it's easy to get lost at night. Um, so go on a trail that you're familiar with. Uh, have your friend trade off with you to take turns with one person walking out in front along the trail um, with a regular flashlight where they can see really well, really clearly to make sure that you're not stumbling over any uh, like roots or falling into a crevice or walking off the side of the trail or stepping on something that could be harmful like a rattlesnake. Um, and if you, if you, um, go with a friend and one of you can walk one way ahead with the light and the other one can walk behind with the UV light looking for scorpions and then you can trade off on the way back. Uh, so super simple, um, great way to stay safe. If you're out during the day, just make sure that you bring plenty of water. Uh, out looking for scorpions in the hot heat is always a good, a good uh, way to get dehydrated um, and that's like my least favorite thing about hiking. Also, make, it's a good idea to wear clothes, so choose when you're out looking for scorpions. Uh, you don't, you don't want to like step on anything or get or accidentally drop the scorpion on your foot and it stings you in your big toe and then like it's uncomfortable to walk back to your car. Uh, so just like exercise in common sense, but otherwise we don't really need any like safety precautions, just really common sense and good trail um, hiking uh, practice. Okay, so um, with that, I just wanna say like, I would love to have your observations for our Spiny Things Challenge. Uh, we're really trying to finish out our picture of scorpions here in the state of California. We wanna construct range maps. We wanna look what, to see whether there's been changes in their distributions over time because of climate change or human development. Um, and more importantly, we just really wanna know what we're sharing this great state with. Um, for help on iNaturalist with your scorpion IDs, uh, you can always tag Prakrit Jane and Harper Forbes, who are really like my go-to guys for identifying scorpions on iNaturalist. You can also tag me, uh, but really probably won't be of much help. Uh, those guys will have it handled. Uh, so again, we'd love your observations and I'm handing it over to Sarah. All right. Cool, okay, so um, I suggested thistles as a project idea for um, the spiny projects for Biodiversity Week. Um, for the most part, because I think that thistles kind of get this bad reputation. And that's because of a couple of bad eggs that we kind of think of as thistles. And so I thought it would be a great idea to kind of shed some light on the diversity of thistles that we have in California. And also to remind us that, you know, it's important to document the um, native species that we have, but it's also really important to keep an eye on invasive species. So all of this photo documentation that might have, that we might get from uh, this project can be useful in a number of different ways. So, um, you know, one of the reasons why thistles get such a bad reputation is because, oh, hold on, how do I advance? Oh no. <laughs> Hi, Sarah. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, no worries. So you can just advance from your actual presentation window. Okay. Sorry, guys. Okay, here we go. Next slide. <laughs> okay, so one of the reasons why thistles have this, this bad reputation is because some of them are like super invasive. Um, we have a couple of pictures here of some of our um, most invasive species here in the uh, Bay Area. Um, we all kind of collectively call these thistles, even though they belong to uh, four different genera. So just a few of them are Onoportum. Uh, we have Centaria here. These are sometimes called the napweeds too. Uh, Carduus over here on the right, and then of course, Circium up here. So the genus Circium is kind of what we think of as traditionally the thistles, but all of these guys have the same kind of general 
appearance, this kind of cup shaped flower, lots of um, spiny, prickly, pokey things everywhere. And then that bright burst of color uh, at the top. So again, these are some of our most uh, invasive species here. And, and they're really invasive um, because they're amazing competitors. So uh, one way that they compete really well in their environment is the way that they grow their roots. So here's a diagram of the root growth. Uh, so we have one individual here who has grown its roots down really, really deeply, but also broadly in a horizontal manner. Uh, this is called rhizomatous growth, growth here. And the benefit of this uh, rhizome is that uh, at any point along its length, new individuals can pop up. And from each of these individuals, a new stem, a new set of flowers, and a new set of seeds can be born. Um, another thing that makes them super competitive here is that each of these stems, when it puts out flowers, will produce hundreds, even thousands of different seeds. So when it does start putting its propagules out, there are a ton of them, which means that it becomes a pretty decent competitor uh, for space to grow. Another thing that makes thistles really competitive and, and um, really good at being invasive is the fact that they have, that they do this thing called allelopathy. So that's a pretty kind of technical word, but basically what it's referring to is the fact that the plant can make these chemical compounds that get put into the environment. Um, sometimes the compounds are in the leaves and then when the leaves fall, they leach into the soil. Um, but sometimes those chemical compounds are produced in the roots or even in the seeds. Now these compounds can have positive but also negative effects um, for all of the plants that exist around that particular plant. And in the case of thistles, many of their roots and their germinating seeds uh, will produce these compounds that actually inhibit the growth of any other plants that occur in the, in the local area. So not only are these thistles like amazing at growing big massive roots and having the clonal growth where those new individuals pop up, not only do they make a ton of seeds, but they also kind of engage in chemical warfare with uh, other plants that might be competitors with them. So they're really just, they can be very invasive. Now, another reason why I think that thistles get kind of a bad reputation is that they are heavily armed. So here are two pictures that kind of show us how many spiny, pokey, prickly things are just waiting to impale you if you got up close to this. Um, this is typically a, um, an anti-herbivory device for plants. So, so they make these prickles and, and, and spiny things so that predators, herbivores, won't want to eat them. So um, just as a quick side note here, uh, a little plant morphology lesson, um, plants arm themselves in a number of different ways. And kind of the three main ways that they arm themselves are with spines, thorns, and prickles. And we give them different names based on the types of tissue that they come from. So for example, uh, spines are modified leaves. So these are some spines at the side of where a leaf used to be. Uh, thorns are modified stems, like this one. And then prickles are actually modifications of the dermal tissue and plants, so the skin of the plant. So when we talk about thistles, we should be thinking about prickles. <laughs> so looking back at these really heavily armed thistles, they're full of many prickles um, that just don't make you wanna run up and hug it, right? So, so given all of this armament and the fact that there are a couple of species that are incredibly invasive, I think they get kind of a bad reputation in, in general. But the thing is, is that um, thistles are part of a really um, healthy and natural ecosystem. So uh, I've got a couple of pictures here of some um, butterflies that are sipping nectar from thistles. 
Thistles produce a huge amount of nectar that are a really important food source, not just for butterflies, but also other flying insects and hummingbirds and all kinds of different pollinators. They make something like 80% more nectar than uh, many of the other things that are flowering at the same time. So they're a really, really important food source for uh, insects and birds. Um, thistles also provide tissue um, or a, you know, a living place for uh, insects during different life stages. There are some that uh, are not too shy of those prickles, some insects that aren't too shy of the prickles, uh, and they make their homes in uh, thistles. And then thistles also pr produce a ton of seeds, as I already mentioned, and those seeds are a really nutritious food source for many of our native seed-eating birds. So here we have a, a goldfinch that is uh, eating the seeds from this thistle. You can see some white fluff uh, around his beak. That's part of the, the seed of the plant, and I'm gonna show you a picture of that in just a second. But that's kind of a favorite um, nesting material for many of our local birds. So this picture here on the right um, is, a, is a photo of a nest, and you can see all that white kind of downy material. Um, part of that downy material is made up of thistle pappus. Um, so, another important use uh, for the thistles. So uh, thistles are part of the sunflower family. This is the Asteraceae. Um, one of the cool things about the sunflower family is that what we think of as this big giant sunflower is actually a collection of many smaller flowers. Uh, so here I've got a cross section or a longitudinal section of an inflorescence. So if you, if you took one of those flowers and you cut it down the center and then opened it up and looked at one side, this is sort of similar to what you might see. And, and I'm including this because I just want to point out that one of these massive flower heads actually has many small flowers um, uh, inside of it. And if we zoom in on one of those small flowers, this is what they look like. Um, here at the bottom is where the seed is, and this is that um, meal that the goldfinch was eating earlier. And then this pappus here, that's what that white fluff was that, that they put in their nests to make it nice and soft. And then we have the other parts of the flower up here, the petals and the male and the female reproductive organs. Okay, so we know that thistles are part of a natural healthy ecosystem. And, and I'm also going to tell you that we have many native species of thistles here in California. Um, and here I have just a collection of some of our native species. Um, I think we have 19 named species and each of them have, um, or many of them have a number of subspecies that have been described. Um, we can find these thistles all across the state. Some of them are um, localized to certain parts. For example, uh, Circeum mojavensi, the Mojave thistle, as the name implies, is down in the um, Southern California uh, in the um, Mojave Desert. Uh, but we can find many of these uh, species all over. Um, you'll notice that uh, each of these pictures uh, has the name of the plant up here, and they all belong to the genus Circeum. So of all of these things that we think of as thistles, Circeum is the only genus that is uh, native to California. Okay, so where do we find them? Um, if we're looking for the native species, uh, we're, we're going to want to go to places that for the most part have um, pretty good drainage, uh, we want to see um, kind of intense sunlight. They're oftentimes in disturbed areas too. So this is a picture of, of a native thistle there in the foreground. And you can see that it's on this big kind of open slope. Um, this is kind of at the edge of a woodland. So, um, you know, places where lots of direct light can come in and soil can drain pretty easily. Um, we can find thistles just outside our back door uh, in disturbed areas again. So this is uh, next to the road here in my neighborhood. And I know you can't see it very well, but if you zoom in in this little area right here, we can actually um, find this little guy that was um, blooming just down the road from my house. So disturbed areas in our neighborhoods, roadsides, fence sides, um, or fence rows. We can also find them in parking lots, 
um, heavily trafficked, um, well, and not so heavily trafficked hiking trails, um, any kind of place where the soil has been um, disturbed. Okay, so when you do encounter a thistle, what should you photograph? Um, so one of the most important things to photograph, of course, is the flower. We wanna get the flower from the side if possible. And that's so that we can see the texture and the number and the order of what we call the filleries. And that's these little uh, leafy things down here at the base of the flower head. Uh, if you can get a picture of a flower close up, that would be awesome. Um, this is somebody holding one by that fluffy pappus. Um, uh, if you can't get it, it's not a big deal, but that's a bonus, I guess. Uh, you need to get a picture of the leaves. If you can get an entire leaf, that would be great. We wanna see if the spines are all along, or the prickles, <laughs> are all along the margins of the leaf. If you can also get the underside of the leaf, that would be really uh, useful. That helps us to identify uh, species. Um, if you don't wanna use your hands, you could use a stick maybe to hold it back uh, and then take a picture of the undersurface. We wanna get a picture of the stem. And here again, we're trying to understand how much of the plant the prickles cover. So do the prickles go all the way on, on the internode areas between the two leaves or do they not? And then finally, if you can find a picture uh, or if you can find some of those rhizomatous growth, <laughs> um, the new individuals that are popping up around the main plant, and be a good picture to, or a good idea to take a picture of that. So we call these basal rosettes, and, and here's an example of one kind of from the side. And if you look down on it from the top, it might look a little something like this. These guys can be pretty big, but they can also be pretty small. Um, and, and having a sense of what the leaves look like in the, in the basal rosette is important if you can. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna leave you with our native species, uh, and I wish you good luck and lots of fun um, as you go on. And I guess I will hand it over to Rebecca. Yeah, thanks so much, Sarah. Um, it was so fun to learn about all the scorpions and all of the thistles. Um, my challenge, so the third challenge in the trio of spiny things, is a little bit different in that it's just one species. So what I want you all to go out and look for, if you can get to the coast, um, the California coast over this week, is this species. This is the California spiny lobster, Panularis interruptus. And this is a picture from um, underwater. You can see it's a beautiful, beautiful lobster. One thing you could might be able to notice, it's a little bit different than lobsters we're familiar with because you can see this lobster, right? The main, the kind of main lobster, or lobsters you see on your dinner plate, um, usually has these huge, huge um, front claws. And if you look back, this lobster, the California spiny lobster, does not have any big claws like that. Um, people still fish for this species, and it's actually quite delicious. Um, but it doesn't have claws. But you probably won't see it like this underwater unless you dive. Um, but I want you to look for it, um, pieces of it on the beach. And I'll tell you why a little bit about this species. So, oops, okay, well this slide is not exactly right. But you can see this is the range of the California spiny lobster. And um, it's also found in Mexico. But if you look closely here, you can see this um, kind of lighter red area. Red is the range like the where it's really, really common, where this species is really common, which is Southern California into Baja, California. Um, but if you see this little bit that's a little bit of a lighter red, this is where the species is a little less common. And if you look closely, you can notice that, that the, the kind of known northern range limit of this species is the southern end of the Monterey Bay. Um, so that's if you ask people or if you look in books and you want to know where the California spiny lobster lives, that's um, everyone says it lives to the northern edge, the southern edge of the, the Monterey Bay. Um, and, but once in a while, there, is, there are records of this species um, appearing further north. And that's because it's usually attributed to warm water events, like El Nino events. And the, the theory goes that this, this lobster has, um, it has a larval stage that's planktonic, so it can move with warm currents or move with any currents. And the females, when they lay eggs, which is usually in the summertime, they, or they carry these eggs with them and they carry like 
thousands and thousands of eggs. And then those eggs are released into the water col column and they have a few different planktonic larval forms that are really beautiful. Um, and those can get really far um, on water currents. If you wanna learn more about them, actually you can look at the Smithsonian, the um, Scripps Institute of Oceanography. They have amazing photos of these larval forms on their website. And so we know that this species can be found further north during El Nino events. And the idea was that their larvae can get further north and then maybe those larvae can settle and grow up a little bit, but that it would be too cold for their north for them to mate. Um, so this is kind of like the common knowledge about these, these lobsters. Um, but, you know, starting in about, I don't know, maybe 2010, 2009, um, in, the, in the Department of Invertebrate Zoology at the Academy, we started hearing rumors that people were seeing these lobsters further north, specifically in Bolinas, which is in Marin County. And then in 2011, I was walking on the beach during a beach cleanup in September, right around this time of year, and I found a lobster molt like this. I found a piece of a California spiny lobster on the beach. Now, I was super shocked because I had never seen this. I've been walking on beaches in California. I mean, I'd seen them in Southern California, but never in Northern California. So I took this piece and I put it in the collections at the California Academy of Sciences um, to document this is like the furthest north it had been seen with some evidence. Um, and since then, since 2011, we have seen people observing and taking pictures and sharing on iNaturalist and photos of spiny lobsters further north. So if you look at this map, these are the, the um, iNaturalist observations of California spiny lobsters. You can see here in Southern California, they're quite common. It's very common to see them. And then you can see that there have been observations. These are the furthest north up in Bolinas. But since um, that first discovery, we've seen more and more um, further north. And in, there's a, in, at Chrissy Field in San Francisco is a place that we see these lobster molts. So when the lobster needs to grow, it molts its exoskeleton and you just see the molt on the beach. So you don't see the lobster live, but we see these molts. And usually it's this time of year. Um, it's right after the, the young have gone into the plankton and then I think there's a, there's a molt. And so a lot of molts wash up on the beach this time of year. So you can see, we know that we've seen them in Marin. We've seen them in San Francisco. We've seen them a few places in San Mateo County and a little bit at the, and also here at the Northern part of um, the Monterey Bay in Santa Cruz. And so what I'm really interested in is if this lobster species is moving further north because of warming waters, which is our hypothesis, um, we need more information. So we have a lot of observations from Bolinas. We have a lot of observations from this one spot in San Francisco, and we're starting to get more observations here from the central part of California, but I would love to know more about how common this species is. And that's really my question and my ask of you. If you're on the coast, especially in the Monterey Bay area, um, kind of on the beach, but near where it's rocky on out um, in the water, um, kind of north of Santa Cruz um, or the north of Monterey, um, I'd love to see if these molts are washing up on the beach. I have a little video to kind of show you how these observations have increased over time that we've seen more and more up here in the San Francisco Bay Area, but there's this area here where we don't know that much. So it's actually kind of further south than I said, a little bit like San Luis Obispo um, and some other places. So here's that map close up. I just kind of want to tell you where I'm most interested in observations, south of San Francisco, north of Marin, because we do know that they might be seen on the shores of Sonoma County. And then this area kind of between Monterey Bay and um, Southern California, these beaches are a little harder to access. Um, but if you can get out there, we'd love to know if lobsters are found there. And when you see them on the beach, like maybe you'll see a whole lobster molt that looks like this. And then this is really easy. You're like, okay, obviously this is a lobster. There's nothing else that looks like this um, that you would see on the, the beaches of California. Um, but sometimes you see it mi missing different parts, right? So here it's missing kind of the head, the head area, but you can see the tail and you can see all these legs. Um, but a lot of times you just see the tails. Um, either from the top or from the bottom like this. 
um, or like this. So sometimes they're bright red and sometimes they're brown. And then sometimes you do find these little bits that are just the head bits. Um, or sometimes you find just those antenna. Um, and all of these are really important. So if you just take a picture of this and upload it to iNaturalist, it helps us understand where these lobsters are offshore. Um, so here's that spiny lobster again. So we, one of the things that I'm interested in is this range expansion because of warming waters, but it's also really important. So that's, that's interesting on its own, but these lobsters are also voracious predators, right? So they live kind of in the rocky crevices of um, offshore, but they eat a lot. And two of the things that they especially like to eat are really important for our coast. One is California mussels, which are a really important foundational species for the rocky intertidal. And so understanding where these lobsters are found might help us understand changes that we're seeing in mussel populations um, or might help, help us better interpret what we're seeing in mussel beds. Similarly, they also eat these purple urchins. And purple urchins, as probably many of you have heard, are two, they're actually both species of urchin that are found off our coast, both the purple and the red, they eat kelp. And so they have the decline of some urchin predators in Sonoma County has contributed to a decline in kelp. And so if lobsters are present and they're eating urchins, does that help the kelp not be eaten by urchins? So it's really important for us to understand where lobsters are to help understand kind of these food web dynamics of kelp forest and the rocky intertidal. That's another reason that your data is extra um, important. And you could also, by just walking on the beach in one of these places and taking a picture of a spiny lobster, you could really be the first one to see this the evidence of that these lobsters are offshore um, on a beach that you might frequent regularly, which is kind of a fun feeling. So I just wanna wrap up with telling you about the two projects. So if you make and share any observations of the species that Lauren and Sarah and I just described, just talked about, so scorpions in California, thistles and their relatives in California or spiny lobsters, they'll be added to automatically to this project on iNaturalist. And you can see this morning, I took a little screenshot. You can see that people had already seen um, all these species. So 11 different species of thistles, scorpions, and then the spiny lobsters. So if you go out and make your observations, they're automatically be added here. But remember, you can also take pictures of anything anywhere in California. Um, and this was this is that same project that Allison described. And you can see as of this morning, already um, over 2,600 people had made observations and made 11,000 observations of a bunch of species. <laughs> so this is incredible. This is just shows like what we can do together if everyone is making and sharing observations. So this was just, you know, just up until this morning, starting on Saturday. So if you get out there and make observations, they will also be added to this project and it will help us understand um, where plants and animals, not just the ones that Sarah, Lauren and I talked about, but all plants and animals where they're found in California and help us um, celebrate that biodiversity and also help us give us the data to understand um, changes that we might be seeing. So with that, I'm going to hopefully Laurel will bring us all back and we can um, take some questions um, if you have any. Thanks so much. They have questions. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. That was that was I learned so much. That was awesome. Um, I'm going to dive right in. So Gail asks. So this was for Allison. Sorry, from Gail. Um, so she just wants to clarify because people are always, it's it's kind of great how people are really concerned about doing this right. Yeah. Um, if we're not sure what something is, is it better to guess and potentially be wrong or should we just leave the ID empty? I think it's always better to put something in the ID. Um, you can guess all the way down to species and it's fine to be wrong. Sometimes you actually might get an ID, a correct ID faster if you put the wrong ID. That's <laughs> how some people work that way, right? Um, but no matter what, if you don't want to pick any of the suggestions that iNaturalist tells you, it's still super helpful to just say, like, this is a plant. Or I know that this is a crustacean. If you see a piece of a crustacean on a beach and you're not sure if it's a lobster, you can say it's a crustacean, and that's totally fine, too. Um, so putting some ID will help people who know how to identify those groups of organisms find your observation on iNaturalist faster than if you leave it blank. So put something in there. Okay, perfect. Great. Don't be afraid. Go for it. <laughs> Um, so this one's for Sarah from Allison L. 
Uh, she asks, this is sort of a general botany question, um, but I thought it was interesting. Are you concerned about the genetic impact of California native plants being offered in nurseries? Oh, oh, that's, that's very interesting. So yeah, so, you know, a lot of people, specifically with the thistles, they want to include some native thistles for people to be able to grow them in their um, gardens. And again, one of the reasons why they want to do this is because um, those thistles provide such an amazing uh, source of nectar for uh, pollinators. Um, they create a uh, habitat for uh, lots of insects uh, mm -hmm. as well. So um, I don't know that I'm worried about the genetic impacts of these native species um, being in nurseries or in our gardens. Um, perhaps if we pull them really far out of their, their natural habitat, they're not gonna be as successful um, living, you know, in, in a, for example, if they're trying to be grown in a desert <laughs> when they're from an alpine meadow, that might be pretty hard. So I wouldn't worry too much about having the natives in our area. Okay, great, thank you. Mm. Uh, Lauren, this one's from you for Michael, who is clearly uh, either a Breakfast Club fan or um, a Lauren Esposito fan because he saw your previous presentation and called you out because you said previously that there was one scorpion that does not fluoresce. So you've been caught and also if you'd like to know <laughs> the name of the species and can you remind us where that's found? <laughs> so there's actually a whole group of scorpions that, that fluoresces only very, very, very weakly, like I, arguably not at all. Um, and that's a family called Carillidae or the ghost scorpions, and they are in South Asia and Southeast Asia. Um, so no, no trouble for us here in California. They all fluoresce very, very brightly, um, as well as most of the rest of the world outside of Southeast Asia and South okay. Asia. Okay, but good job, Michael. Um, and then Lauren, this one's also for you from Lori. And um, she asks, should you put the rock back on the scorpion after you find one and take photos? You said yes, but she, um, I think she'd like some tips because she's worried about squishing it. That is a good question and something that I worry about as well. So I'll tell you my strategy, um, which is that I just, I just like put the rock back really slowly because as, as you're setting it down, like the scorpion and whatever else is under the rock will feel the the pressure of the rock and will get itself to a place where it's not going to get smooshed. Um, also, like for the majority of things that are under rocks that aren't like vertebrates that run really, oh, I forgot to mention one tip for rolling rocks and logs, <laughs> just pull it towards you. So reach your hands over it and pull it back towards you because if there is anything under there that um, is potentially more dangerous than a scorpion, like a snake or even like a lizard or a mouse that might want to bite you, um, then you have the object between you and that animal. Um, but those things will run away almost in instantaneously. So everything else that's left under there is just like arthropods. They have a hard exoskeleton, which is like a shell. It's really like dense, it protects them. Um, so as you set the rock back down, they'll, they'll be, as long as you don't like let it drop, it'll be fine, just go slow. Okay, yeah, just give it a chance to run away. Yeah. Um, Oh, and Michael's name is Mikhail, so I want to apologize for that. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Lauren. Um, this one's for Rebecca. It's from Sarah, age 11. How nice. small is a spiny lobster when it first looks like a lobster instead of like plankton? Oh my gosh, that's such a good question. So actually pretty small. So it has, it goes through, these lobsters are amazing in their planktonic stages. They go through like 11 different stages in the water column. Whoa. And it's not till they get to the last one that it looks like a baby little lobster. And they're really, really small. So I would say go to that Scripps um, Institute of Oceanography website because it has pictures of all of the stages with a, um, with a little measurement. So you can see oh. how small they are. Okay. Um, you know, we've seen some, I've seen them that are pretty small. During the last El Nino, people found them in the San Francisco Bay and actually brought them to the Academy because they're like, what the heck? Why are there lobsters in the San Francisco Bay? I've never seen this before. And the um, California Department of Fish and Wildlife actually has, because this is a fish species, they have an amazing um, formula that they can figure out how old it is based on the size. Um, and so they, you know, even like this big, is like three years old. Like they get there, they grow quite slowly until then they start, once they get big, then they start growing quickly. They kind of like snowball, but they, when, they, when they're very little, when they first settle, they're very, very small. Oh my, okay, I'm also going to that website to see the mini, mini <laughs> lobsters. <laughs> um, this one is for Sarah from William. 
um, who often sees ladybugs on thistles and asks whether thistles and ladybugs have a symbiotic relationship. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if the ladybug depends on the thistle for any part of its life cycle. So mm -hmm. I guess technically I don't know the answer to that question. Um, but my guess is that, you know, noticing those ladybugs pretty regularly on thistles suggests that that thistle is important for its lifestyle somehow. <laughs> right. Um, okay. Yeah. So I, but I don't know that it would be dependent just on thistles. Okay. But if you see one on there, take a photo. I'll say, yeah. in, in, so in my garden where I grow artichokes, yes, the ladybugs love the aphids <laughs> that are on my <laughs> artichokes. That's a good one. And, and I get them I'm, all over them. <laughs> yeah, and I'm glad you brought up the artichokes. I meant to say this in my talk. Artichokes are related to groups that we call thistles. So that's the genus Cynera, I think. That's funny. Um, and that is one that we eat and enjoy very much. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I would also just add that if you see ladybugs um, on thistles eating aphids, in all probability, it's a seven spotted ladybug, which is an, a species that was introduced to the United States uh, in the 1960s to control aphids and is invasive. So, right. Yeah. Wow, that it question is like ladybugs too. <laughs> and it's kind of yeah. like the thistles that Sarah described. Like we also have native ladybugs. So, yeah. and the story that Allison shared. So if you see a ladybug, take a picture because it could be this really common introduced one or it could be this more rare native one, but you never know until you take a really good picture and upload it to I know. Yeah, I also love that that question just like looped in all the citizen science <laughs> stuff and the botanist and the entomologist. Um, let's see, so this one is for Allison from um, John and he asks, is there a most wanted list for things scientists need photos of in California? Oh, that's a good question. It would be amazing to have like a full most wanted list of yeah. things in California. We often put together most wanted lists for particular projects that we're running. Like we have one for the California coast because Rebecca and I are both marine biologists and we run a big coastal bio blitz every year. So we have like most wanted for the coast. And now we have like what these three um, want <laughs> for the California Biodiversity Week. I will say that um, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, they run a, a database of kind of the more rare things in California. And they're also always really interested in getting observations of those. Um, and they actually have a project on iNaturalist for those also. Um, and you can see the full list of all those, all those species um, there as well. But I don't think we have in one place like a list of all the most wanted, but I love that idea. We should totally do that. Yeah, it's great. And maybe you can help me drop some of the links that you referenced just now into the chats <laughs> later. Yes. Too. Okay, great. Um, this one is for Lauren again. This is from Cody. Uh, what is the rarest scorpion in California? Ooh, the rarest scorpion in California? Um, there's a few species that like are, there's no, uh, there's no observations of at all on iNaturalist um, mm -hmm. of scorpions. So there's like a species page, but if you go to that species page, it will just say zero observations. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say like some of the rarer ones, like there's some in Death Valley that are super rare, um, just because it's like a pretty inhospitable place and a national park. So you, like people aren't encouraged to like flip over rocks or touch anything. Mm -hmm. um, and there's there's a species, there's a genus called Gram Loeus. I don't, it's like, that found throughout a bunch of the state, but it's like relatively rare. I think that in part it's because people often, uh, com often confuse it for a really common species that we have, um, which is the Western forest scorpion, which is found like all over Northern California um, in any like forested area essentially, or woodland. And I, I think like they look really superficially similar. So when people see it, they're just like, oh, that's the same thing that I see everywhere without realizing that it's like a totally different genus. Actually, it's a different family. Um, so. So that's one. Cool. Okay, thank you. So they're just either mixed in there or maybe people don't take bother to take the photo because they think it's something more common. Yeah. Okay. Um, awesome. Uh, Allison, for you again, this one from Kathleen. What happens when you don't have internet? <laughs> Specific to iNet. Oh, okay, yeah. That's a, I'm assuming you mean like if you're using the app out in the field, like if that's you don't have any sort of 
any sort of connection like a mobile network or internet. Um, yeah, so you can still make and share, you can still make your observations and save them in the app itself. Um, your GPS should still totally work um, if your location services are on. So even if you don't have any other like mobile network connection, they, it'll still um, tag the place. What you won't be able to do is get those um, suggestions for the species um, if you don't uh, have a connection. And so what I usually do is I, take those photos, I make those observations, and I save them just in the app as um, unknowns at the time. I don't actually put anything in there. And then when I'm back home and I have my internet connection, I'll edit all those observations. You always have the option of editing your observations. So I'll just go into each one and hit that edit button and then use the artificial intelligence to help me tell, figure out what it is. Okay. Um, and, then, and then upload them. Okay, okay, great, good, great. Um, let's see here. So I'll take this one, the last question. Um, this one for Rebecca from Janine. Uh, if we see a spiny lobster molt after the fluke of observations is over, we should still add it to iNaturalist, is that correct? Yes, anytime. Yeah. So this yeah. week, um, I thought it was super great because it fit with our spiny theme. And also this is the time, in at least in this northern part where their range is expanding, that we see their molts most often. So it's not true for the whole state, which is really interesting. When I was preparing for this, I looked it up. And um, you know, for the whole state, you see most um, in July, but that also might be because more people are at the beach in July. So there's some confounding factors. But um, so right now is a really good time to see them in Northern California, their molts. But anytime you see one anywhere in California, if we okay. want. And that's really true for all of these projects, right? And just yes. for... Okay, because we're celebrating this week, but this is this is life here, and we need to know what's there to protect it. So, <laughs> all the time. Um, and I don't want to I don't want to wrap this up without um, saying hello to a very special guest that people who's caught Lauren's previous talk may have uh, met before, but will certainly want to meet again. Lauren, can we can we say hello to Tina just to give people a little scorpion realness before we disappear? <laughs> Tina. Okay, so here's Tina. I'm gonna make you for this. She's hanging out in inside of her little log, which like, you know, like let's just, so Tina's not a species of scorpion from California. She's a species of scorpion from Africa, but she's like right, a little bit bigger than a lot of the species we'd see here. So imagine I flip this log over and there's a scorpion in it. It's kind of hard to spot. Uh, she's right, where's my finger? She's right there in this little crevice. But if I had my handy UV light, you can see what Tina would look like. Ah, it's impossible for me to do this. And <laughs> yeah, do it. We saw her. We saw her. Oh, 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 oh. There you go. Oh, there you go. There you go. Yay. Oh. <laughs> there she is. So, so you can see that bright green color. It makes her way easier to spot. She really blends in otherwise. And that is the scorpion strategy to blend in but we have this handy dandy tool to help us out. Now you see exactly how handy dandy it is. So <laughs> cool. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, okay, so I don't also don't wanna let you all go before I remind you to please come back this Thursday at 10 a.m. for um, Sarah's Wild World of Parasitic Plants. <laughs> Get ready. <laughs> We're actually very excited about it and I'll have lots more invasive personal questions for you at that time. <laughs> um, and a reminder to viewers that if you if you are able to comfortably give and, and to support um, outside your own family or the causes that you care about, uh, the Academy Relief Fund um, could really use your support. We're entering our six month of being closed and our, without our visitors, it's really difficult. Um, so there's a button on um, Facebook if you can give and there's a link in the YouTube, but if you cannot comfortably give, then please don't worry about it and just keep watching our programs and interacting with us here because that means the world as well. Um, and with that, I will thank all of our speakers today. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, links for everything that we talked about either are now or will be in the comment section and we will see you all Thursday. Thank you so much. Take care. Thanks everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.